We starting this this week? What's going to happen this week? Tear down this. So this is my last sermon here. It was so short. <laughs> okay. So this will be gone next week. And we'll be back there next Sunday. And then there'll be redone stuff for the next Sunday. Right? Is that kind of the point? All right. What exciting times. I'm excited about this. I'm thrilled. Uh, Mike, you said you need some help. We need some help here with a piano. Or a, a bunch of meter, you know, mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, son. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Okay. Be right after, right? right after. Okay, thanks. All right. We are in First Samuel, and as I said at the beginning of our worship assembly, in First Samuel where we finished up, David kills Goliath. And now everything changes. And we're in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. And a little tune ought to play throughout all of chapter 18. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, because to the people, David is great. Verse 16, all Israel and Judah love David. And the soldiers respected David. And the women danced in the street for David. And Saul's servants admired David. And Saul's daughter loves David. And Saul's son loves David. And in verse 28, Saul's nose that the Lord was with David and Saul hates David. One of these things is not like the other. So let's look at our text. It's on the front of your bulletin. We're in the first five verses of 1 Samuel 18. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his own house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So, in our text, what do we see that Jonathan does outwardly? Verse 4, Jonathan strips himself of his robe, his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. What does this mean? Well, Jonathan was the prince. He was next in line to the throne. He is an older man than David. He definitely at this stage has more status in the kingdom than David, but it is he who is giving David his princely possessions. So everybody knows, you know, that's, that's the prince's robe or that's the prince's standard and sword and shield. And what Jonathan's doing is it's his way of saying, I am yielding my claim to the throne. And he's saying to everyone else, this brave lad here is no revolutionary. He's no rebel, this young man. Jonathan knows that the Lord is with David, and he knows that David himself will be king because we'll find out later on in chapter 23, Jonathan tells David, you shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. So, after Goliath, 
not only for David, but everything changes for Jonathan, too. After Goliath, we see Jonathan yielding his place. Another thing that we see outwardly that he does is that he makes a covenant with David. Now, I'm going to postpone looking at that covenant until a later time. I want to spend special attention on that later. But Jonathan initiates a profound commitment to David at this time. And we will return to that. So we've looked at his outward actions. Let's go deeper now into Jonathan's noble heart. We read in verses 1 and in verse 3 that Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. It is difficult for us in 2014 to know what to do with that phrase. Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. And the difficulty is with us. It's not with the phrase. The phrase is clear. We're the ones with the struggle or the problem. In our culture, we are culturally condemned, culturally conditioned to equate the word love with the word sex. As in, you can't have one without the other. As in, those two words, love and sex, are functional equivalents to each other. In 2014, culturally, we just assume in our dialogue that if there is love between two people of an equal stature in some way, then there must be sex. And in 2014, if you do talk about love between two people, and then you don't automatically go with the flowing assumption that sex is involved somewhere, somehow, then something's wrong with you. You're the one with your head stuck in the sand. You're the one who's repressed and rigid and frigid and afraid of sex or talking about sex. In 2014, if you don't automatically equate love and sex, then you're the one who's denying someone's real humanity, who's denying someone's real personality, who's denying and suppressing the the authenticity of real relationships. And it really says so much more about us and about our own times that for many, many, many people in our own day, When people read that Jonathan loved David, loved him as his own soul, well, they kind of just wink and nod and just assume, you know, well, we all know what that means. And the Bible is just kind of now finding a way to be discreet about it. I mean, it says Jonathan loved David, loved him as his own soul. So, of course, this means that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship. And Jonathan and David did not have a homosexual relationship. And to assume that they did is a misreading of the text, and I will show you why. Let's start with the word love that's used in the text. It's a fair place to start. After all, those who assume that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship, that's where they start. They start with the assumption that the word for love assumes somehow a sexual component. The word there in our text is ahab or ahabah. 
forms of this word are used over 240 times in the Old Testament. Less than 20% of the time, this word is used to describe the love that occurs between two sexual partners. Now, there are at least a couple of words or phrases that are used in the Old Testament regarding a sexual relationship, regarding sexual intercourse. To mean sex, yada means to know. Genesis 4.1, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Or Rebecca in Genesis 24.16, she is described as a young maiden whom no man had known. Or Elkanah here at the first of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to Samuel. The only two times this word, yada, is used for sex between two men, it's in a negative context in Genesis chapter 19, verse 5, and in Judges chapter 19, verse 22. Now, the second word for sex, for sexual intercourse, is a euphemism, a colloquialism. It's shekhav, meaning to lie with. We have a very similar one in our day and age. We say to sleep with, to lie with. And it's used over 40 times to mean sex. And just like yada, shekhav, is used only twice for sex between two men, and both times it is used in the negative, as in thou shalt not do this. Leviticus 18, 22 and Leviticus 20, verse 13. The word for love in our text this morning does not mean sex, and it most certainly does not assume a sexual relationship. In 2014, with so much that is swirling around in our culture, we're the ones who are reading sex into the text. By usage of over four to one, this word in our text for love describes these two major themes. The steadfast love that God has for us, his people, and his creation, or the love that exists between family and friends. Let me give you just a few examples. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. Moses told the people in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, You shall therefore love the Lord your God. Queen of Sheba tells Solomon in 1 Kings 10, 9, Because the Lord loves Israel forever, he has made you a king, that you may execute justice and righteousness. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, God says to his people, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I could give you many, many more examples of this word and its usage. But you can even look here in 1 Samuel 18, in verse 16, all Israel loved Judah and David. It's the same word in verse 16 that is found in verses 1 and 3. So I'm not denying here that the word used for the love Jonathan had for David can be used for the love that exists between two sexual partners, such as a husband and a wife. But I am saying that throughout the Old Testament, the word for love in our text is most often used in another way to express a broader kind of respect and affection and loyalty and enduring commitment. And if you're going to use the word for love in our text in a sexual way and then apply that to Jonathan and David, there needs to be a reason for you to do that within the text. If you use love to mean sex or a sexual relationship, then the burden of proof rests on you, and the proof's just not there. Furthermore, in David's whole story, we are not spared any details much of David's life, his total life. We're, we're not given a photoshopped David in the text. We see David in his life story, warts and all. We see that he is hot-headed. We see that he fails to control his appetite for women. We see that he play, pe plays favorites with his children. We see that he can be disastrously indecisive at times. And most importantly, we are given a detailed account of his adultery with Bathsheba. How David shirked his responsibility as king to go out to war. How he abused his power there with Bathsheba, an older man, his authority, an older man and a younger woman, how he had Uriah killed, murdered, and then how he covered up that murder. We're told all of that. The Bible does not hide David's transgressions. In fact, the Bible exposes those transgressions. 
And one of the reasons David is a man after God's own heart is precisely because when David does violate God's law and then he's confronted, unlike Saul, David repents. Now, the Mosaic law prohibits homosexual behavior, Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. Homosexual behavior is as clearly prohibited as adultery and murder. So then we're left to ask the question. In David's life, why would his murder and adultery be graphically exposed? And yet, on the other hand, homosexual behavior be left unconfronted. That makes no sense. So I'm giving you reasons why equating love and sex in Jonathan's and David's life is a misreading of the text. The first reason has to do with the words in the text themselves. And the second reason that I'm moving to now has to do with how friendship is understood. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, after, after Saul and Jonathan are killed on Mount Gilboa, David, the psalmist, the sweet psalm singer of Israel, the poet, writes a lament. And in that lament, he expresses his grief over the loss of Jonathan. And these are his words in 2 Samuel 1. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. How pleasant you have been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. And those words of lament appear to be insurmountable proof that they did have a homosexual relationship. Why? Why? Well, you know, we just men just don't talk like that about other men. And and to be sure, men today in 2014, today we men certainly don't talk like that about other men. You know, but sticking with the theme of men today, on the other hand, men today are hardly accused of having just a whole bunch of close friends. And men today are hardly accused of being able to handle and express their strong feelings, positive or negative, very well. And we drink, we fight, we sleep around, we retreat into numbing distractions, we bury ourselves in our business, we beat on our wives and children either with hands that hit or with words that cut. But, you know, don't worry about us men. We got a handle on all that feeling and internal stuff. We're good. Really. C.S. Lewis was born in. 1898. He was 16 in 1914. He was not a believer in 1914. He wouldn't be a believer for another 20 years. And even as a young man, he was a rare person. He combined an active, vigorous love of the outdoors and nature and combined that with an immersion, a love of uh, the fantastic joys of books and stories. Well, he found a friend at the age of 16. He was actually his brother Warmsey's friend. Arthur Greaves, who was a couple of years older than Lewis, how did they meet? Well, they met when Greaves was, they were visiting, he and his brother were visiting over at Greaves' house, and Lewis saw that Greaves had an old copy of Norse, Nordic folk legends, and then those two immediately started talking about the best parts of those ancient Norse legends, the war and the bloodshed and the valor and the endurance and the trials. Uh, to me, it just, it comes to my mind today of, 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 of two boys who are into online gaming and warfare, and they, they found out which buttons they like to press the most, you know, and that's what's going on here. And, and they would remain close friends for almost 50 years, all the way up until the time Lewis died. And I'll come back to Arthur Greaves. Well, Lewis did write a little bit about homosexuality. But it's fascinating, by the standard of today's talk, among conservative Christian cultures, C.S. Lewis would be considered sympathetic to homosexuality. Now, he wasn't. He believed it was wrong. But by the standards of today's dialogue among conservative Christians, C.S. Lewis was guilty of committing two 
unpardonable crimes, the crime of civility and the crime of compassion. Lewis was a homosexual, and he did believe homosexual behavior was wrong. Yet Lewis wrote this, what I'm about to read to you, about friendship, and specifically about assuming that there is a homosexual relationship among men who are really, really just close friends, what they used to call boon companions, close friends. This is what he wrote in 1960. 1960, and I believe it's worth saying today. He writes, It has actually become necessary in our time to rebut the theory that every firm and serious friendship is really homosexual. And the dangerous word, really, is here important. To say that every friendship is consciously and explicitly homosexual would be too obviously false. The wise acres take refuge in a less palpable charge that it is really unconsciously, cryptically homosexual. And this, though it cannot be proved, it can, of course, never be refuted. The fact of no positive evidence of homosexuality can be discovered in the behavior of two friends does not disconcert the wise acres at all. That, they say gravely, is just what we should expect. The very lack of evidence is thus treated as evidence. The absence of smoke proves that the fire is very carefully hidden. Yes, if it exists at all, but we must first prove its existence. Otherwise, we are arguing like a man who should say, if there were an invisible cat in that chair, the chair would look empty. But the chair does look empty. Therefore, an invisible cat is in the chair. Looking for a homosexual relationship in the deep and godly friendship of David and Jonathan is looking for an invisible cat in an empty chair. To tell you the truth, I feel kind of sad talking about our text this way today. Because Jonathan is truly one of the great, great souls of all Scripture. He's a prince who gives up his claim to the throne. He's a warrior who fights bravely. He's a son who's loyal to his father, even when his father is wretched. He's a friend and a protector who cares deeply for his friends. He's all that and more. Now, we know from a theological point of view, David is a type of Christ. He's a forerunner of Christ. David prefigures Christ as the righteous king, as the shepherd over all God's sheep. He prefigures Christ as the suffering servant who is the man after God's own heart. We know that. So... Jonathan then, from a kind of theological point of view, he functions in this story as a kind of Holy Spirit because he's the comforter who draws alongside and strengthens and encourages and empowers. And you know, we ought to be able to spend a lot of time talking about those great theological truths about these two wonderful characters. But in 2014, if I'm going to teach you about Jonathan and David, I must seriously take the broad cultural assumption held by many in the world and in the church that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship. And there is a reason that this assumption is so overwhelming in 2014 in our culture today. There is an overwhelming pressure today either to make the Bible say that homosexual behavior is acceptable or to make it entirely unacceptable for the Bible to say otherwise. Instead, I would come back to Arthur Greaves and C.S. Lewis 
Lewis was clear. He was unmistakable. He believed homosexual behavior was wrong. And Lewis maintained a lifelong friendship with Arthur Greed. He was the first person he wrote a letter to after he became a Christian. Over 200 letters. And Arthur Greaves was a homosexual, and C.S. Lewis knew it. And C.S. Lewis never cut him off, and he never stopped loving him as his friend. Friendship. Men, it is a sad fact, it is a well-documented fact, men, that we struggle to make and to keep friends. One of the reasons that women outlive us is that they're, they're better at friends than we are. We men are so intimidated, afraid, uncomfortable with our internal selves. We're afraid of being seen and vulnerable as weak or not in control or in some way needy or not up to speed. Or I could have just stopped that list by saying we're just afraid of being seen and known. I mean, all, all that interior stuff, all that internal stuff of sharing that I was just talking about, I think about that with men, and this image comes to my mind from Monty Python on the Holy Grail, the rabbit going for the throat, run away, run away, run away. Because nothing scares us so much, men, as the prospect of vulnerability and being known. And yet, and yet, don't you remember, men? Don't you remember? Don't you remember your boyhood, men, when you had friends? Maybe a group of friends, maybe just one or two close friends. And don't you remember the sense of freedom that you felt with them? A sense of belonging, a sense of common interests, common values, common activities. I mean, common, common values before you were old enough to really understand what values meant. And, and a sense there that it seemed like if everyone else in the world or at school or wherever, if, if they all thought you were weird or a loser or different or on the outside or not good enough, then there was always this kind of friend of yours or perhaps maybe a group of friends or a circle of friends, and, and they thought you were okay. And they laughed at your jokes. Or if, and if they, uh, if they laughed at you or if they cut down on you, it was really kind of their way of bonding and saying, I, I know you, I see you, you're like me. I still remember their names. People I haven't seen in 40 years. Steve Wallace, John McKenzie, Bruce Bowler, Simon Farmer, Brendan Manning. I still remember my boyhood friends. And I have to confess, I have never had, as an adult male, those kinds of friends. Hard. So here's the takeaway for you, men. I'm not asking you to become weepy girly men, okay? I'm not asking you to go out and form the lonely guys group therapy, you know. But based on our text today, I am challenging you. Find a group of men and be a Jonathan. Love them. Love them nobly. Love them honorably. Love them with purity and a clean, free, and open heart. Love them as a godly man and only want the best for them. Be the godly man who only wants for God to have his way in their lives. Do I have to say that kind of stuff? No, I'm not an idiot. I mean, this is 2014, I get it. Be wise in how we speak. But men, you need friends. 
You need a Jonathan in your life. You need that kind of safety. You need that freedom. You need that sense of belonging. And the best way for that to happen in your life is for you to say to yourself, quietly, within yourself, just between you and the Lord. I'm going to be a Jonathan. I'm going to be that guy. Would you pray with me? Oh God, uh, dust off, clean up our own notions and assumptions about friendships. Oh God, I do pray for our men. Oh God. Cause us to be godly men and cause us, please, over time to be godly friends. Build that into our lives, please, I pray. Oh God, make us a pure people and make us a compassionate people. Help us to remember that you sent your Son into the world not to condemn, but to save. And remove from us, please, O oh God, a condemning spirit. And make us compassionate people. In Jesus' name.